Hi, this is our second video lecture for week seven. And now we're looking at, basically this is a video, a video is trying to draw all the strands together of what we've been doing over the last three weeks. So we're looking at ethics, innovation, patents and monopoly in pharmaceuticals. And hopefully you've come to understand that pharmaceutical industry, the pharmaceutical market is not a normal market in inverted commas, somewhat similar to clothes, furniture, TVs, mobile phones and so on, that the way the pharmaceutical market works, it affects people's health, it affects the length of time they live and so on. So there is serious ethical problems in the way pharmaceutical works. Um, to some extent, these are problems that have only become apparent in perhaps the last 20 years. Pharmaceuticals has developed rather a lot over that period. Now, innovation. I mean, innovation are, are a sort of stereotypical, I suppose. The idea of innovation, developing new products we have in our head, is that somebody in a dark cellar suddenly shouting, Eureka! And, uh, you know, I found it, and the light bulb going on and stuff. Um, that really is not the way that pharmaceutical companies innovate these days. The research and development is conducted in very well financed and a very expensive laboratories. For example, a friend of mine uh, who works, works, works in university uh, medical department has, has, has told me that they visited GSK labs, I think in, is it in Slough already, I can't remember which, um, and they're, they're the envy of any labs that that academia has these days. They're very well financed, they're very well set up, they're very well organised. So um, that is a change. If we went back 30 years, the fundamental research was tended to be dominated by university labs and then the, the stuff moved out to the, the uh, commercial companies. But what's happened over the last perhaps 20 years is that the major pharmaceutical companies developed their own labs and have equipped them very well and are spending a large amount of money in research and development. Now the funding for this research and development is always from the retained profits of pharmaceutical firms. Now you remember I've been going on for weeks now about that is their prime argument from pharmaceutical firms that the reason is that they, they have to make large profits on the drugs that are successful is because they need to retain the profits to put to future research and development to develop new drugs. And their argument that that cycle has to work like this, that there is no there is no alternative to this. Um, as we go through this lecture we well we've come across at least one alternative to this, perhaps there is more. So the thing the, the really important thing to remember here is pharmaceutical firms are commercial businesses. They operate in markets, so they look for business opportunity. And they fund research when potential demand is reasonable. Now potential demand effectively in economic terms is, is demand backed by the ability to pay. It's not enough, for example, in pharmaceutical firms to discover the the, the disease that's I don't know, been suffered by lots of poor people, for example. Um, if if those people, their governments or their health services have not an ability to pay, then there's not effective demand. And pharmaceutical companies, because they're acting entirely rationally, these firms are not charities, they're acting entirely rationally, will not invest large sums in research and development to find cures or treatments for diseases that predominantly affect people who are relatively poor, who can't afford to pay for them. So for example, I mean, there's, there's an easy curable eye disease, which is, I think, still rampant in, in continental Africa, um, which, which is easily treated, but the problem is that people there cannot afford the treatments. Um, You've probably seen on TV over the years that, that there are charities that actually treat these disease. I think they, they say a treatment costs, I don't know, a few pounds or something. It's, it's quite a small amount. But, you know, it's, it's, more, the, <clears throat> it's more than the, the people in these countries can afford to pay. 
Now, if we, if we look at academia, like the University of Westminster, um, there's little independent funding for research and development here. You know, in I think in 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 this university as all others, any research we do related to pharmaceutical products is tends to be applied research funded by the pharmaceutical firms. Um, there is very little, I mean, I, I'm not sure there is any research conducted anywhere in the UK in academia where where it's fundamental research, where the university is just funding its own research. For example, I mean, you will be aware that the, um, the major hope for a vaccine for COVID-19 in the UK is, is is being conducted by a commercial company, Axazeni, I think, and, 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 and the University of Oxford. Um, basically what's happening there is the, the commercial company is paying the university to develop this thing. Um, it's not terribly clear, certainly to any of us, what, what government involvement here is, whether they're paying the company to develop this and the company's paying the university. Um, but essentially that is an illustration of the fact that there is very little completely independent fundamental research in this matter being conducted in academia. Now the problem, as we've, we've been going over the last two weeks, is that the patents thing. I mean, it's it's very rational for the pharmaceutical firms to patent their, their inventions. They want to collect, they want to protect, I'm sorry, they want to protect their intellectual property. Now the problem from society, a consumer point of view, is that creates a monopoly. You know, as being as I've been going on in the in the, the first the first lecture this week and indeed last week as well, that patents create a monopoly, and the problem with monopoly is they're essentially a distortion of the market. Um, the reason over the past few weeks, by the way, I've been going on so much about about perfect competition is that's. That's the sort of the image we have in our heads about how competition market societies work. Um, it's a slightly, it's a very idealized sort of idea of how competition works. Um, but it's, you know, the thing is in economic terms, monopoly is a bad idea because there is no competition to reduce the price or to make the firm efficient. And what happens in monopolies that supply is more restricted than it otherwise would be. You remember, hopefully, having looked at the first first video for this, for week seven, you have noticed that I said, when when patents run out, medicines become generic, and that means that supply expands, supply increases, and that that forces prices down. But in monopoly, we have this whole sequence. While the patent lasts, the supply is restricted and that leads to a higher price. Um, now, there's only, I mean, that, is, that is the normal working of a, a market system. Our ethical problem here is, should we allow the production of drugs to be determined by this? And I mean, that is an interesting and difficult problem to solve. Now I think I, men I mentioned evergreening in the last video, um, not having to explain what it is, but evergreening really is firms taking out multiple patents on drug and so it, it, which makes it very difficult for a generic producer to actually avoid infringing some patent or other. And they tend, the large man pharmaceutical firms tend to be litigate against generic producers. They do they, they spend a lot of money trying to prevent generic producers producing their drugs. And of course you can see the obvious reason why is that once generic producers get to produce a drug the price falls, the profitability of the drug for the original producer um, decreases very, very rapidly. And this is essentially what they're doing. They're trying the Patent holder is attempting to to extend the production of product. Um, as I rather deliberately said here, they they're attempting to present, extend the production of the product in order to make more money rather than extending the life of the patient. Um, 
you know, you, you can make a simplistic argument that having making all drugs very cheap means more people more people benefit from them and so on. But this is this is the kernel of, of what we we have to consider here. Drugs are not a normal product. And should should diseases remain incurable because of lack of market demand? And remember I said effective demand is demand backed by money, ability to pay. And the problem with lots of drugs is that there may not may, demand may not be effective demand in that the people who need the drugs can't afford to pay for them or the countries can't afford to pay for them or their health systems can't afford to pay for them or whatever whatever it is but in essence we're saying that people in poor countries can't afford to pay for a lot of expensive drugs produced by the pharmaceutical market and of course as I've, I think I've said in the last in the last video lecture um, the situation is probably worse than this because a pharmaceutical company will try and estimate effective demand before it puts resources into research and development. So possible cures for lots of diseases that, are, that affect poor people um, may not be developed because the pharmaceutical companies cannot see the effective demand for their products. So one of the things we should look at here is is there is there a solution to this? And one solution that's that's been suggested by by the European Union. I mean, uh, they they um they got a Swedish academic to research this and and write a paper on this. So so I think we should say this this might be a possible solution. But his argument, and I'm sorry I've forgotten the man's name, his argument is separate research and development from production. That if you did that, that production would be a sort of a normal market situation, normal market problem. You know, that what I've been saying for the last two weeks is that that the reason that, that the pharmaceutical industry is structured the way it is is a lot to do with their very high fixed costs. And their very high fixed costs are really related to research and development. I mean, for the moment, by the way, I'm, I'm ignoring the, the marketing problem, but let's continue to ignore this. I mean, essentially, the core problem is that they, they have to produce new drugs. You have to spend a lot of money on research and development. Now, the argument in this paper is that in Europe and indeed most developed countries, Governments either pay for directly or heavily subsidise medicines. In the UK, we we certainly in in, in England we heavily subsidise prescriptions. I mean, in Wales and I think in Scotland, I'm not sure about Northern Ireland. Um, the the situation is that the government absolute the NHS pays and pays pays for the total cost of medicines. Um, there still is some charges for prescriptions in in England, but. The, the argument here, and there is a similar argument to do with health systems in continental Europe. They're structured differently, but nevertheless, the government tends to pay in the end for most medicines. And if you included um, health insurance schemes, um, you could sort of extend this argument to a lot more countries, perhaps even the United States. So the argument in this paper is that that given that the government already pays for most drugs, it would pay the government to directly fund research and development. And that has certain significant effects. Now, the argument is not that the government takes research and development and funds just university laboratories or something to the research and development. The argument is the government pays the existing pharmaceutical companies to do research and development. So they're, you know, the, the commission, I don't know, uh, GSK, to do certain research and development. I mean, this is the, 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 the actual the sequence, the transmission mechanism isn't entirely clear. This is what seems to be happening a lot in the development of, of vaccines for COVID-19. 
So if the government, following on this argument, the government directly funds research and development in, in existing pharmaceutical firms. Now, what happens then is that no licenses are issued or generic licenses are issued, which is probably more correct. So generic licenses are issued, no patents are issued. All pharmaceutical companies who fill the requirements of producing medicines get to produce this thing. So we avoid, the argument here is this avoids the monopoly stage. And we go to normal sort of generic competition. So you're, we're still, I suppose, far from perfect competition, but we're never going to get there anyway. But we have generic prices. And remember, the base argument here is that generic prices are somewhat like 70% less than, 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 than the, the, the price charged by patent holders. So the, then following this argument down, it becomes that the, the government spends less money on drugs. You know, drugs are much cheaper to the government. So it's, you know, the cost of drugs has fallen by 50% and the pharmaceutical firms get paid more for research and development. After that, after the research and development is completed and licenses are issued, the pharmaceutical firms basically compete with each other to produce the drug. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean, by the way, there's no branded drugs, but what it would mean is that, that any firm who qualifies as, as a producer of drugs would be, would be licensed to produce all drugs. Now this this would certainly have an effect, I, I presume, on, on, on the, the profitability of, of pharmaceutical firms. But whether at the level of society, the level of total economy, um, the, the effect would be better or worse is something that would have to be considered. So here we, we get to, I suppose, the real question that's, that's at the end of your problem here. Are governments paying pharmaceutical firms to research and develop vaccine for COVID-19? Um, the evidence says that they are. I mean, how exactly, how exactly they're, who they're paying to do this is, is a difficult thing. It's, I mean, it's not very clear whether um, the firms who develop the vaccine, assuming that one is developed, by the way, um, hopefully one of the things you've understood in the three weeks so far you've been looking at this stuff is that there is no certainty that, that anything will be developed. So there is no certainty here that we're going to have a vaccine. But assume we do, um, we, we still don't know whether the, these vaccines will be patented by a particular firm. And if they are, whether the, the price they charge is a free market price, which means they make super normal profits, or in fact, is a very controlled price, so that that you know that, for example, that the, the the population of the UK can be given this vaccine very quickly, and it doesn't cost the government an enormous amount of money. I mean, these are the questions. I have to say, I do not know the answer to these questions. Um, so it's in in this sense, the problem you're wrestling with now in pharmaceuticals is an open-ended problem. And the other thing to consider in going in working out your group presentation with this problem is is the time scale. Um, I hope it's it's been glaring obvious to everybody that I've been talking about time scales of something like ten to twelve years for development of a medicine. On the other hand, we're now saying that we can develop a vaccine for COVID nineteen in something like one year or eighteen months. I mean, it's it's a very well amount depends where you are. It's, we're terribly political in the United States, it's less than a year. Um, most experts in, in, in medical schools and in phar phar pharmaceutical firms think it's more like a year to 18 months. Um, but we don't know how this is going to be. But there is, you know, a rather glaring difference here between one year, 18 months and 10 to 12 years. And what's the difference? Um, again, it's very unclear what the difference is. But one of the differences may be that a lot of the fundamental research has been done on earlier COVID diseases like Mars. 
so that that stuff is being used to quickly generate vaccines for, for COVID-19. That may be the case. But again, it's as you're going through this problem, you're trying to work out your, your presentation. You know, your conclusion here for the last bit is rather difficult. It's not very clear to anybody exactly what is happening here.